per usual. Um, first item is apologies. Do we have any apologies from anyone? I know Sammy has to leave a little bit early and Paul's upstairs at the event in the uh, room 115 and will be down hopefully shortly. Nothing else? Okay, agenda item 2 then, draft minutes of the meeting on the 24th of September. Pages 5 to 11 on your folder if you want to have a wee quick look through those. And if you indicate that you're happy enough for me to sign off in minutes. Everyone content? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Ten item three is matters arising. Two items. First one is the committee forward work program for October, uh, and you'll see the updated forward work program at pages thirteen to seventeen of your folders. Second item, Justice Two Bill, uh, written submission to the committee for social development. Uh, there, they have uh, we've received um, a note from the committee for social development in relation to the bill, and that's been circulated at pages eighteen to twenty of your folders, uh, and it's also been updated to the uh, electronic bill folder that you find on your. Laptops. Agenda item four then, Justice number two, Bill Oral Evidence. Tom McGonagall, the Prisoner Ombudsman, will uh, attend to provide oral evidence in relation to part two of the bill. Uh, a copy of the relevant papers is at pages 23 through to 60 of your meeting folders. Uh, and there's a wide uh, range of issues on this part of the bill that we uh, will want to explore. Um, there is a uh, clerk's memo at pages 24 and 25 of the meeting folder uh, to advise uh, members as well. So, Tom's ready. On the table. Tell me we are we're hand starting the session, which will be published in due sure. course. So whenever you're ready, if you want to okay. kick off, and we'll open Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, everybody. If I make a few introductory remarks, first of all, to say that I strongly welcome the proposals to place the prisoner ombudsman's office on a statutory footing. Um, I've already provided a written response that I hope you have a chance to read and and form some views upon. From my perspective, the main benefits and points in the Justice No. 2 Bill are the following. Um, it would remove my office from prisons legislation, and that's entirely appropriate. And it's very important to demonstrate both independence and impartiality of an office that should be seen as independent and impartial. Other statutory bodies have told me that it would increase their confidence in sharing information with my office, and by those I particularly mean the police, the prison service, and the South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust. Are responsible for providing health care to prisoners. <coughs> and it would provide a statutory basis for the first time for the prison service for us to investigate the prison service's conduct in death and custody. That's very important because Northern Ireland as a state has a responsibility to comply with Article 2 of the UN Convention on Human Rights. And it currently could be deemed not to do that without a statutory basis for our investigations. It's equally important to say the Justice Bill does not change several things. It's very much intended to legislate for an as-is position, and again, I think that's correct. So first of all, for example, it requires the prison service to, be, to answer complaints in the first instance from prisoners. That's the fundamental building block of any good ombudsman scheme, that the body against whom the complaints are laid should be able to answer those in the first instance. So that's not the change. It doesn't provide my office with enforcement or discipline powers, and again, that's similar to most ombudsman arrangements. I think it's quite appropriate. It's a matter that some prison officers might have concerns about. That would not be changing as this bill is currently drafted. And the final thing that's very important that does not change as things currently stand is that health care complaints and the health care dimension of deaths in custody, the arrangements for those do not change. That's a bit hard for some prisoners to understand or for some people to understand, but there are existing statutory arrangements for dealing with health care complaints essentially through the South Eastern Trust zone arrangements. That works well. There are difficulties, there are some operational difficulties in terms of the health care dimension of deaths in custody. It can delay things for my office when we need to get access to information from the Trust. And there can be an impact of the delay on bereaved families that's a matter of concern. But those concerns can be addressed quite comfortably at operational level. I don't need legislation, but I need to draw your attention to them as legislators in the event that the arrangements might change. Chair, I, I propose to curtail my remarks to that. I could say a lot more, but I think it's better not to preempt questions that members may have. But just to summarise by saying that statutory footing for the Prisoner and Man's Office, I think, would strengthen its ability to fulfil the originally envisaged remit. And that goes back to the Steele Report in uh, 2005, which said a Prisoner and Man's Office would make a valuable contribution to diffusing the tensions which are bound to rise in prisons in Northern Ireland. So with that, I'll hand it over to members for comments and questions. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for keeping it brief. So.
Yeah, refreshing at times. Yeah. Um, just a couple of questions around. You mentioned one of the, the benefits of the office is the independence of your office. I just wondered how you would react to a criticism, perhaps, that how independent can you be when DOJ appoints you and DOJ fund your office? Well, I'm pragmatic rather than purist about that issue, Chair. Um, the reality of the matter is that uh, my office has been and will continue to be advertised to an open advert. The appointments made on merit. Uh, the appointee would be appointed as a corporation sole, which is an independent appointment. The prisoner ombudsman or the prison ombudsman would have a seven-year tenure, which again helps copper fast and independence. In terms of reference, where the ombudsman to be wholly independent. And in my, I'm over two years in the job now, and neither in my experience nor as far as I'm aware in the experience of my two predecessors, nobody has ever tried to interfere with our independence. So on a pragmatic basis rather than a purist basis, I'm quite content that independence would be fully assured. From your view, is it preferable or would it make no difference if there was a, um, an independent body that, that um, appointed you and through which funding was made available? Well, again, it's, it's not much different from other almost men offices in both in the UK and, as, as far as I'm aware, in other jurisdictions, certainly in Western Europe. So I think the pragmatic approach is the important one here. Sammy? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks for your, your presentation, Tom, and the stuff you said us through here. Um, I was just going to ask you, in terms of your present office, what are your staffing levels? Twelve in total. Um, so I'm a public appointee. The other staff are civil servants. So there's a conduit to my office by the Northern Ireland Civil Service, which is an arrangement that works well. Yeah. Um, most of their training nowadays is on the job mm -hmm. training. Um, in the past, there would have been some dedicated investigative training, but the staff uh, work well within the ethos of the office. It doesn't suit every civil servant. It's a very specialist function dealing with prisoners and undertaking the investigative role in a way that's thorough and fair and impartial. So 12 people in total. And in terms of the resources required for the, for the new office, in that sense, will those well, um, go, go and transfer with you? And also in terms of financial resources, um, are, you, are you confident that you'll be able to, to do this job and independent with the resources? Yes, indeed. Yeah. I, I've never made the case for either additional staff or for different types of staff. I'm quite content with, with the number of staff I have. Good. Work closely with the Department of Justice in terms of making sure that we get the right staff. And the number of staff that we have at the moment on the competence base is right for the job. So <coughs> I think the number is about right, the level of civil service grades that they come from is about right, and that, that works well. The, the financial resourcing is, is difficult as it is for everybody. Um, we've had to pair back uh, in terms of discretionary spend in lots of areas. Uh, but we've been able so far to hold on to the number of staff we need to do the job. So the same people at this point in time would transfer, and that makes sense. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. And because it's a relatively small office, does it present any difficulties in terms of having individuals with the right skills? Because you're looking at both, both deaths in custody and maladministration. So because you're a relatively small office, is it challenging for you to get the right skills for the individuals? It, it is challenging, Chair, yeah. And maybe just to, to pick up on a side point, you, you mentioned maladministration. Mal Actually, quite a few ombudsmen's offices only deal with maladministration, but I think yeah. one of the benefits of our office in the Northern Ireland prison setting is that we deal with wider issues than maladministration, so we can look at the merits of a decision taken by the prison service. And a lot of what we do is about trying to broker solutions between prison staff and prisoners. And we advocate on prisoners' behalf to do that, and that, that works well. So it's wider than maladministration. But coming back to your original question, to get the right staff isn't easy. Um, the civil service have worked with us, and the Department of Justice have worked with us as well. So, for example, we use the interchange scheme which means that we've been able to recruit investigators, on a, usually on a two-year basis, from other um, investigative type offices, like Police Ombudsman's office. Uh, and we do have to be careful about which investigator, which civil servants are selected to come and work with us, because it, it really doesn't suit everybody. And we've some people who came in the past, found the job wasn't for them, and left quite soon. So you're right, there's a challenge in that, but we can generally manage to deal with it. Okay. Raymond? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, uh, just in relation to uh, on the face of the bill, the, the, you haven't got the power to compel witnesses to assist your investigations? No. Do you think that would be of assistance to, you, to your role? I think it would be cosmetic, to be quite honest, because uh, since I've been there for over two years now, virtually 99% of prison service staff, mostly officers, some governors as well, who we've asked to, to help with investigations have come voluntarily. If, if we had the power... To, so the power to compel would 
in fact, very few situations actually that we investigate, either deaths in custody or complaints. And I think that if if we had that power, some people can turn up and actually say nothing, or certainly say nothing of any value. So I don't think the power to compel would would assist terribly, and I don't really think we need it. Um, and what about say to compel former members of staff with the with the, they mightn't have the same. Yeah, well, I, I guess I mean, it hasn't. There are certainly some issues where complaints or deaths in custody go back some time, and people who we would need to interview are not available because they're no longer in the employment of the Northern Ireland Prison Service. But I guess the outcome might well be the same. That even if they, even if they are compelable and came along, they might, if if they felt it would have an adverse impact upon themselves, they might not say anything of any use. Anything. It it could be. It could actually be. A, as well as being cosmetic, it could cause conflict, and it wouldn't be helpful, or it wouldn't benefit the, the purposes of the office only. But, but sometimes, yeah, <clears throat> perhaps you know, it, and, and that's I mean, it's a good assertion you make that you know, you know the cooperation has been excellent, yeah. and, and I think that's good to put on the record. But you know, just in terms of someone who feels that perhaps you know, if it isn't a compulsion, then are, are you sometimes limited? Even you know, the, the current situation is fine, and you have said that, but in the future, does it leave maybe people feeling? Uh, that, that some of them wasn't properly investigated, and a, a future ombudsman or yeah. somebody in the room yeah. might say, "Well, if I had a ability to compel, I might have at well, least, you know, exposed a weakness yeah. in the system." Yeah. Well, to put it another way, I certainly wouldn't re resist having the power to compel. Yeah. But in, in, in real, I'm coming back to the realism versus the or the pragmatism versus the purism again. I'm not sure in 2015 it would add anything. But you're quite right; it might add something in the future. And if I had that power, I, I wouldn't resist having it. Yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, and, and just in relation, in terms of uh, obtaining and disclosing information, would that be the same? If you do you feel uh, that the bill is strong enough to ensure that you would get all the documentation? Sure. And, and, and that's that's I accept now. You know that, that there, there has been nobody blocked you from doing yeah. it. But I'm saying just in terms of the the powers, the power strong enough and rigorous enough. I, I think so. I mean, that's one of the real benefits of this legislation. For the first time, it would mean there's a statutory authority now that. If you, Prisoners and um, families of bereaved prisoners who, who, who have died uh, can see that the office would now have statutory authority to obtain those documents, to enter the premises, and to, to require people to cooperate. So, th when that's in legislation, that's a tremendous help in its own right. Okay. Okay. And in, in terms of, of, in particular, Clause 38, and <clears throat> on a number of occasions here, has been official from it is around uh, matters connected to British national security, you know, the powers of the, se the British Secretary of State. Yeah. You know, each year that that's renewed, and the present service and the department are here, but they've never really give us a. Maybe I'm being wrong. They've give us an explanation, but it's difficult to understand what that power, where it begins and where it ends. Uh, would you envisage in, in clause 38 if uh, a power would be given to the British Secretary of State to prevent you from carrying out an investigation? I wouldn't. No. Um at this point, there has been national security guidance in place since devolution of justice in August 2010. It's never had to be uh, invoked in, yeah. in any way, shape, or form. Now that that could change tomorrow, for, for all we know. Um, but I think it's like so many other matters it's about adopting a reasonable and sensible approach to things. The guidance that was drafted in August 2010 has been redrafted, and I would think should be made available to yourselves for your consideration. Yeah. Um, certainly, I'm content with it. For me, the importance there, there are two important aspects to it. It's guidance, and it's guidance to which the prisoner ombudsman must have regard. And I'm quite content to have regard that it doesn't impede or shackle me as ombudsman or future ombudsman in any way. It's, it's guidance, which I th and it, again, national security guidance isn't unique to the prison ombudsman in Northern Ireland. It's, it's, it's guidance that's used in a wide variety of other oversight settings. See, we, we've had some sessions with you no know, legislative council, you know, and w one of the sort of lessons that come from it is sometimes that perhaps the intention is, is what you're saying that has never been used, but the power could be there to be used in the future. So the way, if you don't have, if you don't need a power, why would you ask for it to be yeah, yeah. in legislation? And that's why I asked the question, and I accept what you have said. There's been no obstacles, and it's the uh, same with. Uh. The power to compel witnesses, but it's it's the ability, you know, it's sometimes in the future. So that's why I ask because it says here you must have regard. Yeah. So if the guidance came to say don't don't investigate that, well, yeah, well, are you are you on the face of it? Uh -huh. uh, when it says you must have regard, have you to fulfil that guidance? Say don't investigate that because it interferes with. 
I've taken legal advice in this matter as well, as you can well imagine, and I'm told that the guidance as currently drafted, and it is still draft guidance in principle, um, it, it does not fetter the, the prison ombudsman's office in that sense. It's, it's guidance which the prisoner ombudsman must have regard, and I can work with that in a legal sense as well as in, in spirit. So, so you don't see this as in any way uh, being a, a, an impediment to carrying out any, any investigation? Thank you. Okay. Alvin. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and, and can I thank you for your attendance today and um, the work that you've done. And uh, certainly, in dealing with your office, it's, it's certainly been um, a very uh, constructive uh, engagement, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, can you just clarify one thing for me um, in relation to? Uh, health care complaints. Uh, your office can investigate those. Um, is there any restriction on the, under the new dispensation, or is, does that remain the same? It's not quite the case. Um, yes. The office cannot investigate health care complaints. Cannot? No, no. Never uh, could. Never could. And it's not intended that. Well, well, can, I, can I just stop you there? Yeah, because yeah. Th there was a recent case yeah. of death in custody. Yeah. Now, I know it wasn't directly a health care complaint, but it was a death in custody arising out of complaints about the level of health care. Uh, is that an entirely different situation? Is <laughs> yeah, that materially maybe, different? Yeah. Maybe I should yeah. try and elaborate. Yes. On uh -huh. that um, th there are two two rules that we do. One is investigate prisoners' complaints, and yes. the other is investigate deaths in custody. We never could, and this bill doesn't intend that we will be able to investigate health complaints about health care. And this is confusing for prisoners, and it's confusing yes. for the public, and understandably, yes. so, so I welcome the chance to clarify. Yes. Um, so if a prisoner has a complaint about their health care, <coughs> that goes through the South Eastern Trust and ultimately to the Northern Ireland Assembly Ombudsman if they're not content with the answer. In relation to deaths in custody, we do investigate the health care dimension to deaths in custody. And that's very important, because the interface between health care and prison officers role it is so so important there's virtually not a death in custody that doesn't have a health care dimension to it yes. well mental health care as in many cases and the two recent cases one that we published this week one last week mm -hmm. about their physical health care so we do investigate the health care dimension of death in custody it's very important that whoever uh, ultimately does that i think my office should continue to do that um, because we've seen lots of examples where there are communication difficulties between prison staff and health care staff, where things don't work out well, sometimes to the detriment of the prisoner. And I think it would be a mistake to have two different offices investigating. So the prisoner office not office investigating the prison service dimension of things, and another office investigating the health care dimension. Somebody has to look at how those two offices operate together, because the, the, the prisoner, in effect, is under the care of the prison service, they have to make sure he, he gets access to his health care, but it's for the South Eastern Trust to provide it. And you can't, you can't separate those neatly, they're, they're, they're too interrelated. So if I'm a prisoner and I have a, a problem, a complaint in relation to health care at this moment in time, and indeed the future, whenever they, uh, uh -huh. your office put on a statutory basis, I still will have to go to the uh, assembly ombudsman in relation to health care. Ultimately, if you're not content with the yeah. trust answer to you. Or, or right. the new office of NIPSA, whenever that might yeah, that's right. to, that's right. to, to be in. Thank, thanks very much for, for clarifying that. That's extremely useful. And, and there, obviously, Chair, there, there is something that I think needs to be looked at in terms of trying to mm. rationalise uh, a rather confusing situation. Um, during the course of the debate and the uh, second stage of the bill, I referred to the title uh, of your office, or the new title of your office, which is Prison Ombudsman. And uh, I, I just raised a query in relation to the title, because I felt um, on reflection that uh, Prisoner Ombudsman was a better title because it captured what I thought was the essence of uh, your function, which was to really, in essence, to look into prisoners' complaints. Um, and I, I'm still minded uh, uh, to, to, to be of that view. 
Well, I was wondering if you would care to comment on that uh, uh, and to um, uh, see if uh, you agree or disagree with that. Certainly. Uh, I support the proposed name change. Uh, I think it makes sense in terms of emphasising the impartiality of the office. The, the term prisoner ombudsman apparently was coined at the outset of the office in 2005, and nobody can quite understand where that came from. But uh, what I have found in just over two years that I've been in office essentially is that prisoners' uh, expectations need to be managed. They expect, because I'm the prisoner ombudsman, that I should find in their favour and complaints, and prison staff think exactly the opposite. And that they think, well, you're the prisoner's ombudsman, therefore you're automatically and inherently biased against us. And for me, one of the key principles of this office is impartiality, and I'm very keen that it should be seen to be impartial. And therefore, while there may only be two letters change in the name, uh, I think symbolic, it's more than symbolic, it's very important. If this office is really to be seen as an impartial office, that the name should change, so I would support that. Um, and it doesn't reduce. If you think earlier what I said about maladministration, we are about more than maladministration. We are about trying to broker solutions between prisoners and prison staff. And I, th I think to do that properly, we have to be impartial. And finally, I suppose I would draw some analogies. Uh, my counterpart in London is the prison's ombudsman, and we don't have a pensioner's ombudsman, we have a pensions ombudsman. So I think there, there, there's, mm -hmm. there are good grounds to base the change upon. Yeah. No, I, I can see the arguments uh, both ways. and. Uh <laughs> I, I will consider what you say, okay. but uh, it, it, it struck me at first instance anyway that uh, Prisoner Ombudsman was the preferred title. Um, just in relation to um, the whole idea of the independence of the appointment system, as the Chair raised earlier, um, uh, and the DOJ would, would, would carry out the actual appointment, um, under the proposed legislation for the NIPSO, uh, it would in fact be the Assembly and through the Assembly Commission that would carry out that appointment. Um, and that might be a, a, a preferable way of, of making the appointment, so it removes any yeah. suggestion of, of, of bias yeah. or prejudice or lack of independence. It might be something worth considering. I wouldn't resist that at all. Yes. Um, it, you know, quite honestly, uh, I think it, it, it's, it's immaterial. I, I can see several tangible aspects of the role as it's projected should be that makes sure that the independence is reassured. But I think if that were to be further strengthened by a different route vehicle to make the appointment, I wouldn't resist that in any way. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, thank you. Do, do you do you see any argument, or would you have a desire to extend your role to look at issues involving youth justice agency or probation board or? Well, that, that's one of the. Uh, the there, there's a clause in, in the draft bill that allows for that. Now, it's um, to, to undertake all investigations as requested by the department. And I think that makes sense. Uh, to date, there have been very few scenarios where that might have arisen, but at least that, that possibility is included. One of the issues that would need to be safeguarded against, I suppose, in terms of that sort of extension to, to such as probation or the Youth Justice Agency, is that again, like. Southeastern Health and Social Care Trust. There are existing routes for, for prisoners to complain about those aspects, or there would be existing routes for people to complain about probation practice or youth justice agency practice, and that is via their internal mechanisms and then to the Northern Ireland Assembly Ombudsman. So we could not have duplicated any provision. That, that would be a mistake legislatively, I think. Thank you, Chair. And this is um, not really a question, it's more a comment on yeah. picking up the confusion that exists among prisoners Aye. when it comes to making complaints against the health service. Um, I, I would suggest maybe that, that you should contact Tom Frawley's office, the public services ombudsman, and maybe Tom should be getting that information out there to prisoners if that confusion exists. Yeah, no, that's a fair comment. Um, I suppose uh, I have quite an open dialogue with, with North Ireland Public Service Ombudsman's office, as this to be. Um, I think you're entirely right. It, patient client counsel are already involved in helping to try and promote understanding amongst prisoners of exactly that type of scenario. One of the issues is the prison population changes so frequently, um, and you know. An issue like a healthcare complaint or a complaint about prison staff only arises sporadically for prisoners. Um, so it's, it's not top of their agenda to retain that sort of information. Quite often we get phone calls from prisoners to make a complaint about healthcare. We can simply then redirect them. So 
it's not that hard to, to get it right, but it, it's just it's a structural yeah. error, I suppose, in terms of how we're set up. I, I, again, it's just in terms of clarification. In <clears throat> clause 30, <clears throat> excuse me, under complaints, uh, a person visiting a prison, mm -hmm. does that include, you know, say, uh, members of the, 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 the independent members, who could, you know, visitors who come in, or is it just a, strictly a relative visitor? Is that envisaged? It, 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 well, it, it's, it would be envisaged to primarily focus upon relatives of prisoners who are visiting, yeah. and that's, that's the purpose of it. The reality is we have very few complaints from relatives, but who else are you thinking of that, that might say, be? Say, for talk's sake, a, a, a teacher or yeah. a member oh, of yeah. probation who's going in, yeah. you know, if they, if they feel that they haven't been treated properly by yeah. the prison yeah, staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, certainly the first route should be through the, the, the internal channels. Ultimately, I guess, um, if if they wanted to complain, it would depend what they were complaining about as well, I suppose. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm just telling again, just in clarity. Though, yeah, uh, yeah. So, because much in the same way it says a prisoner being treated by a prison officer, uh -huh. you know, say in terms of the definition of prison officer, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. uh, I assume that includes governors. Of course it does, and that's the place to come to us are about governors, yeah. Uh, and say again, Without prejudice, yeah. say a member of the vocational teaching staff. Yeah, yeah. Would yeah. that be classed as prison officer? So, if a prisoner had a complaint about a teacher, is yeah. All right. Well, then that that wouldn't come to us because yeah. one of the things we've, that I've clarified with the DO Department of Justice in, in discussions about this draft bill is that, for example, the probation service has has several staff who work in prisons. If there's a complaint about them and the you know, prisoner take issue with the race score, the risk assessment score, I think. That, that's not eligible to come to us. That would go through the probation service internal route, first of all, and then to the Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman. But I, I can see there in terms of a, you know, a type of assessment. Yeah. Which, but yeah. say, like, for, I mean, a teacher or vocational training staff or a, a, a probation yeah. staff member yeah. was insulting or mm -hmm. derogatory. Sure. Then, oh, yeah. What's the procedure then? Is it, 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 this is not part of your office? Is it no, be a no, no. Staff? We're exclusively dedicated to the prison service and complaints yeah. about the prison, and then the healthcare dimension of deaths and custody as well. And you've, you've, you do have lots of other organisations who work in the prison, such as lots of NGOs, for example, and again, if their staff um, give rise to complaints, that has to be done through the NGOs yeah. mechanism and then to the Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman. So in the health facility, say in McGabry, if it was a, a member of the health staff, then that complaint would be made directly to the Southern, the Southern South Trust, Trust rather than to the, yourself? To the South Eastern Trust. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. OK. Lovely. Thank you. Anyway, for somebody else, there's a couple of just points I want to pick up on. Um, yeah. In terms of ensuring that investigations are carried out in a, in a timely manner, um, Clause 32 doesn't place any requirement to initiate an investigation within a certain time scale. Is that something that you think would be of value, or is there any reason why you would resist it? No reason why I'd resist it at all, Chair. Um, and I think it's one of several operational issues that will be dealt with in the rules that will underpin the legislation that goes through. Um, I think it's a very important point you make, because it's important for prisoners to have their complaints dealt with as quickly as possible. Uh, we can only deal with them once they reach us. and. Sometimes it takes, it takes a considerable amount of time for complaints to get through the two stages of the prison service process to our office. So I, I would have no objection to it whatsoever. The, start, the clock would start, need to start to tick whenever we receive the complaint. And just finally, would you, um, again, appreciate your view on whether a clause should be inserted into the bill modelled on the Section 58 of the Police Act, which required, would require you to disclose to the police where a report indicates that a criminal offence may have occurred? Yes, and I think I said that in my written response. That, that and I, the, DO, the Department of Justice would agree with me that that uh, stipulation is set out in relation to deaths and custody, and I think it should also be in relation to complaints because I think it's a common law duty. Okay. Anyone else? Any questions? No. Tom, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, <coughs> we go on then to agenda item five. So officials are going to attend to provide an update on DOJ in-year financial position, and members will find the relevant papers 62 through to 120 of the meeting folders and in 17 of the tabled pack. Um, so I welcome uh, Glenn Capper and Lisa Rocks and Patrick Barr to the committee.
um, you'll be aware we're on starting a session which will appear in due course on the website. Um, but whenever you're ready, if you want to kick off, and then we'll open up the questions afterwards. So, your time. Good afternoon, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to give you an update on the Department's finances. Um, I plan to cover two separate areas in this briefing. Uh, firstly, an update on the Department's 2015-16 financial position, and then progress on planning for the Executive's next budget. Uh, I'm aware that the, the information you received in advance mightn't be as detailed as usual, um, and I'll explain why, um, but hopefully I'll, I'll be able to bring you as up to date as possible. Um, in this session, so I'll apologise in advance if, if my comments are, are lengthy. Uh, so we're looking firstly at the in-year funding position. Uh, by way of context, you know that at this stage of the year, we normally provide an update on the Department's October monitoring position. However, as the Committee will be aware, there are ongoing financial issues facing the Executive, and this has meant that the June monitoring round has not yet concluded. Advice from DFP officials is that the January monitoring round will be the second and indeed the final monitoring round of the financial year. Uh, therefore, I can give you some information on this year's finances, but unfortunately, given wider issues, I am not able to be uh, definitive, definitive about the next steps or potential cuts. Uh, I will begin by recapping on how this year's budget was set, uh, and I understand that Christine has also provided you with some slides that will hopefully be useful. Uh, through its involvement in the 15-16 budget process, the Committee will be aware that this year is extremely challenging. Uh, very difficult funding and prioritisation decisions have and will be required that will have a major impact on the wider justice system and the services we provide. So, In setting this year's budget, uh, the starting point for all DOJ spending areas was a reduction of 15.1 per cent from our opening baselines. Uh, an allocation of £90 million pounds was provided by the Executive as part of the draft and final budget process. So, In some areas, this funding was used to offset specific demand-led pressures. In other areas, it has been used to offset the impact of baseline cuts, and so some of our organisations have cuts lower than 15.1 per cent. Conversely, some areas have higher cuts, so that funding can be reallocated to frontline priorities. After applying the 15.1 per cent cut to the Legal Services Agency baseline, uh, the available funding would have been 64 million, approximately 40 million short of the then forecast legal aid requirement. Therefore, the Department had to increase the baseline by using some of the executive allocation and deepening the scale of cuts elsewhere. However, even with an increased baseline in 2015 16 and the work undertaken to make savings in this area, there remains a legal aid pressure. Based on the agency's most recent forecast at that time, uh, the Department bid for £23.9 million for legal aid as part of June monitoring, and we brought that before the Committee at the beginning of June. Uh, given that this monitoring round has not yet concluded, uh, a decision on this bid remains outstanding. So then, To bring you up to date with our current assessment of the in-year position, uh, the Department continues to face some significant pressures. The most recent legal aid forecast uh, taking into account the most up-to-date information on case costs and volume, shows a pressure of 21 million. Uh, we also face pressures in the prison service, where we believe that we will need to provide extra funding of around £4 million pounds this year, and pressures in relation to legacy costs. Um, it is not yet possible to quantify these, but the implications of the funding package set out as part of the Stormont House Agreement will be important, as without additional funding, these costs will remain an unfunded pressure. Following the advice of the Finance Minister in June, asking departments to preemptively halt all remaining discretionary spend, we also have some potentially significant savings. As you will know from our June briefing, uh, the Department's Accounting Officer asked all DOJ spending areas to identify savings from discretionary spend. Therefore, uh, we expect that we will deliver savings as a result of proactive decisions to stop spend. <coughs> So, for example, uh, PSNI has made a firm commitment to finding in year budget cuts of 2.5 per cent, which will be roughly 15 to 16 million pounds, um, and has already identified potential savings to this level. I understand the Policing Board was advised of this commitment by the Chief Constable in a September report, and we expect police to be in a position to firm up the detail of where cuts will come from in the next week or so. As a result of the proactive decisions we have made, uh, the, con the conundrum we now face <coughs> is that we will seek to manage our own pressures 
and break even as a department. But given that the DOJ budget is no longer ring fenced, without executive agreement and in the absence of a monitoring round any time soon, there is no mechanism to reallocate our budget. As I said earlier, from our understanding, the next time the executive is due to consider an in-year monitoring round is mid-January, um, which even if uh, budget adjustments were approved, um, is too late. Uh, this means that we will have to continue to work closely with DFP to see how we can best, if at all, secure some flexibility to manage our budget. Uh, the other question you, you may well have is whether there will be further cuts coming this year, uh, but unfortunately we don't know the answer to that yet. So just to sum up then where we are in terms of the in-year position, um, firstly we've asked spending areas to stop discretionary spend that doesn't need recourse to the department. <coughs> um, secondly, we continue to work closely with areas that have tabled the possibility of delivering a certain level of cuts, um, noting that they should continue to plan to deliver those. Um, and then in the absence of anything further from the executive, we as a department are planning to consume our own pressures and live within budget. Um, that means not exceeding our budget, and we've told our areas that they should not expect any additional funding. Unfortunately for each area, it also means that further cuts might be a possibility, but we can't say how likely that is, what the scale will be, or when it might happen. We've asked them to preserve as much flexibility in their budget as possible to manage this, even if it happened in January. Uh, so as you can see, the situation is far from ideal, health, hence it's been difficult to provide any detail to the committee at this stage in the year, uh, but hopefully today's briefing brings you as up to date as possible about our current in year funding position. Um, if I can say something again briefly about the next spending review, uh, the next executive budget, again there is uncertainty. The process for that has yet to come before the executive, uh, but it is right as a department that we begin uh, some scenario planning as soon as possible. Uh, it has not been confirmed if the executive's next budget will be for one year or if it will consider a longer period. Uh, our sense is that it will be for one year, and on that basis, uh, we have this week asked all DOJ spending areas to consider the impact of two scenarios in terms of budget cuts for next year. Um, those scenarios will examine a 5 per cent cut and a 10 per cent cut. Um, we have asked each area to set out the impact of these scenarios under three headings. Um, so, Firstly, any back office or administration impact. Secondly, any frontline impact, and then thirdly, any frontline and public safety impact. <coughs> this should allow the Minister and the Department's Strategic Resources Committee and indeed uh, the Justice Committee to take informed decisions about the impact of cuts uh, to each area and the justice system as a whole. Uh, the work we are undertaking should put us in a good position to be able to respond to the executive's process when it is formally launched. In terms of overall financial planning, we feel it is important to undertake some more medium to long term work. And on that basis, we also plan to do a more strategic review around funding priorities and potential savings for the years from 2017 to 2021. Um, this work will be completed in slower time than the 16 17 work, um, which we think will have a short turnaround time once commissioned by DFP. I should also say that in terms of future capital commitments, DFP have asked for some early information about our long-term capital plans um, with a view to informing the 16-17 capital budget. Um, your slides show a very early summary of that work um, with the information that we know at the minute, and we will brief the committee as that progresses. However, there is little doubt that we will need to prioritise our capital plans to live within budget. Uh, so I hope that provides you with an overview of both our in-year financial position and our progress and planning for the executive next budget. Um, and we're happy to take any questions you have. Can I first of all thank you for sending through the slides? M members might find it useful. Page five of their table papers is a really really useful <coughs> presentation that makes things very clear for us. So thank you for doing that. I did. I don't think anybody used them during the presentation, but it's very very useful. I can just. Look at a few areas. You mentioned the PSNI and their two and a half percent savings. Um, have you any input in terms of where they make those savings? I suppose the sceptics among us may think that bodies such as the PSNI may make their their savings in areas of the highest public impact in order to try to get some sort of um, sympathy from the policing board, from other politicians, about how they do with more money. I know that relationships in the past perhaps haven't been particularly good between the department and. PSNI in terms of sharing information around budgetary issues. So, is there any input that the department has in terms of how the police will make those savings? 
the department asked all accounting officers across the departmental family to identify savings and I suppose the chief constable along with other accounting officers was asked to do that and it's a matter for him where he will identify those savings and as Glenn said in his introductory remarks we'll work with the SNI over the next few weeks to understand where those savings will come from but no we don't input into where they would come from no. In terms of the relationship with information sharing and looking for whether savings could be made from shared services and things has there been a marked improvement since the last well, over the last Year, maybe. Yeah, I think the, the, the process for sharing information with the police is, is very good um, in terms of financial information uh, and in terms of shared services and so on. Um, the police is, is actively engaging with uh, the department and indeed the wider civil service. Um, for example, in considering um, through IT Assist, which is the, the NICS's wider IT service, so that the, there's lots of ongoing engagement there. In terms of the police underspend that we had not so long ago, is there any indication if that's going to happen again, or are you confident that there won't be a huge police underspend? I think last year's police underspend, which was 14.4 million, was 2% of the PSNI's budget, so it wasn't significant in terms of the proportion of the budget. But I suppose in things that drove the underspend, there were a number of areas, one of which was the uncertainty around the in-year budget in position in 14-15, <coughs> where there were difficulties around sort of late cuts in the year and the Chief Constable had to plan the budget on that basis. Also, in the budget, public disorder wasn't in the region that it was expected, and also legal challenges form a very significant area of fluctuation. And indeed, part of the police underspend was a late legal challenge that settled for three million less than anticipated, which formed actually 20% of their underspend. I just want to, because we had a relatively good summer, I wonder if any money would be would be returned or whether the, the Minister would have to surrender that to the central pot? I think that th those sort of discussions will form part of the information we hope to get from police the next week or so about where this year's cuts might come from, but uh, my, my expectation is it will be proactive decisions police to, to make savings this year. And if that money then comes back, the Department will have to, the Minister will have to surrender that to the centre. He can't reallocate that money within his own budget, can he? That would depend on the DFP processes because, as Glenn mentioned in the introductory remarks, there would be areas of approval needed by the executive and would have to put that in as part of a Mondrian round. And given that the PS and I have identified those proactively, then along with all of our audit, other bodies who have identified agents, then we would like to see how those could be allocated against our pressure. But again, that would need executive approval. In terms of the discretionary spend and stopping discretionary spend, can you give us an idea of where we will see that? I mean, if, if, from a public point of view, where will they see the impact of that, or which bodies are, are getting the impact of that, and where are they making the, the savings, or where are they stopping discretionary spend? Hopefully, uh, as I said, the, the, what we've asked bodies to do at the minute is to stop discretionary spend that doesn't need recourse to the department. And what we mean by that is um, hopefully it'll be discretionary spend that needs organisations gift and therefore low impact to stop. So the first tranche of that should be from areas that would have a relatively low front line and, and public impact. So we're not talking about money that may be going to community groups and things like that? Not in the first instance. As I said, we, we don't know if there's further cuts coming, um, but from the discretionary spend we've identified thus far, we're not in that space yet. Okay. And just touching on legal aid issues, obviously there's the, the ongoing court case in terms of the, the challenge to the department um, from the... Uh, Bar Council and Law Society. That wouldn't have an impact for, for this year, I presume, but next year and the year after that could have a fairly significant impact. Has that been factored into the 5 and 10 per cent scenario planning? 5 and 10 per cent scenario planning is, is, is literally just something that we've, we've launched. Uh, in terms of the ongoing court case, obviously it wouldn't be appropriate to, to comment on that at this stage, um, other than to say uh, that when the Legal Services Agency produces its next forecast. Um, I imagine it will be based on the assumption that savings already uh, and the implications of the new rules in place um, are factored in there. Um, the outcome of the court case may well um, change that forecast, but I think the forecast will be based on, on the rules as they currently stand. And, and you mentioned where the shortfall currently is not meeting this year's uh, legal aid budget. I'm presuming that if that's not able, if the department's not in a position to pay that this year, it's a double whammy next year then, so there is an incentive to try to get paid this year in order to help your budgeting for next year. 
And then just finally in the voluntary exit scheme, here's a, a bit of information about how the voluntary exit scheme within DOJ has, has worked with the uptake of that and savings. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the lease here. I think we'll have some, some hard facts and figures in um, there. I suppose we do have some facts and figures, but some of it will depend on the outworkings of the remainder of the scheme for the remainder of the financial year. As part of the Department's savings delivery plans for the current financial year, we assumed four million of savings would be achieved through the voluntary exit scheme. In tranche one, 81 staff of the department left yesterday, and that will generate savings of approximately 1.3 million. In tranche two, who will leave at the end of November, 74 staff have opted to leave, and that will generate savings of 700,000. And tranche three, 147 staff have been have received the offer to leave, and we'll not know until the end of October how many have accepted <coughs> that. Thank you, Chief. Um, Patsy? Thank you very much, Chair. <clears throat> I think what probably triggered me off there was um, the process of sharing of information with police being very good. It doesn't seem that they are very good at sharing and they're given the, the cutbacks, sharing their information with access to that. Um, <coughs> if, uh, and they're saying it's budgetary. I don't know whether it is or whether it's an efficiency. Just if, I could, if you could bear with me, I've just had an email from a solicitor acting on behalf of a, of a man. At the end of April, he was successful in getting a job with a trust. Um, access sent for clearance on in the first week of May. He had scheduled, because it gives 60 days, he had scheduled that he would leave work in his present employment at the tail end of June, because of his 60-day alleged turnaround time. <clears throat> Still unable to take up the job of the trust until the ESNI confirmed and returned that particular cheque. June, July, he lived on his savings. August, he had to resort to benefits because he had left one job within an anticipated 60 day period and had to resort to, to benefits and still didn't receive any clearance until uh, the 24th of September. Now, there, there's a man, and it should be emphasised here. No criminal record whatsoever. So, if now I really don't know whether that's down to inefficiency, whether it's down to cuts, or whether just I don't know what's going on there. But to my mind, that's a person who has been seriously disadvantaged, had to dip into his own savings to keep himself uh, taken over, and then had to resort to benefits because of the inadequacy of the system. Now. I'll pass on details through the committee to have it checked into, uh, because that, if that's the outcome of inefficiencies or cuts, neither the two are acceptable. And I'm sure none of us would wish that upon either ourselves or any of our family members uh, to be placed in that position. It, it is something I think, Chair, we need to call both XS and I, but particularly the police, back to look at this stuff. Um, it, it just seriously is not on. That here's a person who's been actively, he's been persecuted because he hasn't a criminal record. Uh, it's, it's not on. So I don't know what you have to say about, or what, or if Access and I and the police have been in touch with the department around recurring problems like this, or not. If they haven't been, clearly they're not doing their job either. If they're not bringing this to the fore. Um, I do think I'd be able to, to comment on that specific. Issue or if that's an isolated incident? No, but I think this has been, just so that you know, Mr. Capper, this has been a recurring theme at this committee from members right, right across who have been raising this and has been raised with them in their constituencies. So if you haven't been appraised of it, somebody's not doing their job, we would venture to say. I got something I need to take back to colleagues in the department with a, a, a more specific focus on that area. All right, please do. Okay, okay thanks, JP. Thanks, Patsy. Sean? Uh, thank you, Chair. I spoke about two scenarios in the future, a uh, 5% and a 10% cut. Is that across the board, and what impact would that have on the frontline services? I think the purposes of the scenario planning is to understand exactly that. It's to understand what the impact of those two scenarios would have on each of the department's organisations. And in setting the 2015-16 budget, we did something similar, which allowed us then to identify areas where, for example, the frontline and public safety aspects were too difficult, and therefore we protected some areas. So at this stage, it is scenario planning only. And frontline and safety, what examples have you? 
Um, for example, in the court service, where they might say that there was a reduction in sitting days or there was increased waiting times, things like that, that obviously we prefer to target, as we did in 15-16, the sort of back office administration savings. And in terms of, uh, I know we got a briefing last week on the safety college, the community safety college, that's a great and it hangs in the balance, and the money is 78 million underspent. Where does that sit? Does it go back, or, or is it within the department? As it currently sits, the business case is being finalised, and we hope to have that at the end of November. And that will set out what the funding requirements will be going forward, and that will then inform the capital planning. And I think in the pack of slides, there's sort of forecasts of the capital going forward. And that doesn't as yet include the forecast for Desert Creek because we're currently working up the business case, but it will form part of our discussions with the DFP as part of the next executive budget for capital. Thanks, Sean. Brom? Thank you, Chair. Regarding TBOC, Together Building a United and Shared Community, there's not 0.7 million that's going to be allocated between uh, DOJ, Belfast City Council and the Housing Executive. What, what's the rationale of all the money going into Belfast City Council and the Housing Executive, just focusing on Belfast, when this is a strategy that actually covers the north of Ireland? Um, I think at the last session, as part of June monitoring, uh, we presented our bids uh, within the DFP, and as you rightly say, £700,000 was the department's bid, um, and that was one of the things actually else was as part of June monitoring. In terms of the specifics about why certain money goes to, to certain areas and so on. It's um, all going to Belfast though. Well and, and yes and, and relation, point. in relation to where the money goes to, I think we're probably not the most appropriate people to ask, as in we're, we're, we're coming at this from a point of view. But what I can do is certainly go back to colleagues in the department who deal with T Buck. Right, and okay. I, I would probably get you a better answer than, I, than I'd be able to give on that. Right, okay. Well, can you get clarification on um, what it means by additional staff resources to this DOJ interface action team? What, what exactly does that mean by staff resources? Is this travelling expenses? You know, I want that kind of detail, if you don't mind. But, you know, can this be changed if we're actually going to, you know, focus, have a broader focus than just Belfast City Council? I'll, this is a big issue. I'll certainly take those questions back to, to colleagues and I'll come back to the committee in writing on that. Okay, thank you. I think we've written to the department about that issue after last week, so they may wish to speak to somebody else, but they're, they're aware of it and they're hopefully getting a response okay. to us. So, Raymond? Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. And <clears throat> I suppose it's a, a theme which I have developed and have asked a few questions about it so over time, and it, it relates to the. I mean, some of the sort of be like particular questions that, that members have asked, but it's, it's that idea of impact and who assesses impact when these uh, budget lines are being decided. Now, I, I think, you know, I, I spoke recently about in terms of the, the size of the PSNI budget, they have to make reductions, you know, but it's, it's the examination of that. And I just said in terms of what's in front of us is, you know, in one round of spending, they have to cut back on certain services, and then they come forward with a bid for £1.5 million for cyber <coughs> Does someone ask them, you know, why is that the priority, say, over some of, their cut, you know, some of the services they had to cut? Is that a role of the policing board, or does the department have a role in that as well? I think there, there, there's a tripartite arrangement there where, yes, one of the roles of the policing board is to review and, and scrutinise sort, those sorts of bids. And yes, they do come into the department and, and are reviewed as well. I think there, there's a specific thing around, if we look back at June monitoring, the police's only bit, I think I'm right in saying, was for that particular cybercrime. Um, and that, I, I, I'm not sure where it would rank in police's overall priorities. No doubt it's, it's a high priority. But that was a specific bid because there was a similar pot of money available for police forces in England and Wales. So th that's why that particular one took on a, a, a bit of a, a part of June. But, but in terms, again, and I think it's maybe something we can develop, and, and I'm not just talking about here in this particular budget and all budgets, but just that, you know, we're, we're sometimes, you know, and Brahman has mentioned about, and again, without prejudice to the answer, you, know, you have T-Buck and a certain amount of money going to a particular place. 
you know, is there someone in the department saying, you know, look, you need to be careful there, you know, that our areas have made the bed, why are we making that a priority over A over B, so to speak? Is that part of the, the process or is that outside your control? Well, I suppose things like TBUC, because they're a separate pot of funding from OFM to AFM, they're not kind of competing for the same amount of funding. You know, so whenever the police are looking at where they're spending their money and taking cuts, that's part of what the department allocates to them. But in the case of, for example, together building the United Community, that is a separate pot of money that they would bid to. But I'm talking about the assessment of it. I mean, you know, say like the police service have provided money in local areas for, for, for gates and, you know, <clears throat> and if someone came in tomorrow and said we're, we're giving, putting aside £100,000 to continue on that scheme, has it a department or will say make sure that's spread properly or is it the police set the priority? That, that, that would be me. I think point. the process would be police would internally set their priorities and then as part of our normal monitoring rounds and indeed our bigger annual spending review slash budget processes, um, all those priorities from across all our bodies would come to the central department. Um, and we'd assess those. So if, if I give you an example, I'm, I'm touching what Lisa said about for the next spending review. Um, we're asking all our bodies to assess the impact under a series of headings. One of the impacts we're asking for as well is the impact across the whole justice system. <coughs> so, cuts. so as a department and a board, we'll sit down and look at that. And no doubt as part of the process for setting the budget for next year, that's the sort of information we hope to bring to the committee to allow the committee to have its place in those sorts of decisions as well. And as part of that, it'll also pick up the sort of equality issues and whether or not any potential cuts would have any equality impact. And that's excellent because, I mean, the, the, the reason why I said, like, if you have a large area and you lost one worker, you know, where if you're a small village and you lost one worker, then you know, the obvious impact and it's it's it's, it's who is ultimately responsible for that. Now, I assume people who do that would have that measure as well, but it's just that, if you like that second day, look at it, they say, here, hold on, that looks a bit imbalanced, uh, and it's also ultimately decides the budget, so therefore we're going to allocate the money, but you have to ensure it's not centred in, in one case, you have to think the three or four. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, just Nobody else has indicated, just finally in terms of, uh, I noticed over lunchtime there was a, a Press release from the Department of the Asset Recovery Community Scheme, and um, money right across the, the, the province in terms of, of, of uh, community projects, which is all very welcome. In terms of the 15-16 budget, how much money has been spent in the community and voluntary sector compared to the previous year? Because we've had quite a bit of interest from members right across the province about some of the community fund. Um, th that, uh, to, to be honest, differs by by area um, because our. As you'll see in the slides, I think one of the, the complex things about the DOJ is the number of bodies. Yeah. Um, I mentioned earlier with five agencies and six across the whole NIC, or 11 across the whole NICS. Um, so each of our bodies has taken a decision about cuts um, independently, and then we've looked at it across the department. Um, so, for example, some areas will have protected the boundary and community sector more than others. Um, I know probation board youth justice have tried to protect their grant funding uh, as far as possible. But to answer your question, I think it's in the region of um, 13 to 14 million pounds we spend in total across um, voluntary and community sector, um, and that includes DCSPs and so on. Okay. Any other members? No? Happy enough? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. We move on then to item 6, <coughs> and we'll go to page 122 to 149. Uh, just to remind the committee, following a recommendation from the committee following the inquiry into the criminal justice services available to victims and witnesses of crime, the department gave a commitment to provide for a statutory victim's charter. The victim charter was subject to public consultation and introduced initially on an administrative basis on the 31st of December uh, 2014. The Justice Act 2015 provided for the charter to be laid at the Assembly in place on statutory footing once the date of coming into operation has been affirmed by the Assembly. At the meeting on the 10th of September, the Committee agreed that it was content with the proposed statutory rule to bring the Victim Charter into operation. The draft Victim Charter and the draft statutory rule was laid by the Department on the 14th of September, and that's subject to the affirmative resolution procedure. There have been no changes to the policy content since the SL was submitted to the Committee, and the examiner of statutory rules has indicated he has
is no issues to raise with regard to the technical aspects of the bill. So if the committee is, if the committee is content, I'll put the question formally. But the committee for us has considered such a rule of the Victim Charter Justice Act Northern Ireland 2015 order, Northern Ireland 2015, and recommends that it be affirmed by the Assembly. So members content? Agreed. Agenda item 7 then. Uh, can I refer members to page 151 of the PACs? Uh, section 36 and Schedule 3 of the Justice Act makes provision for the relevant information about victims and witnesses to be automatically shared <coughs> by the police and the public prosecution service with prescribed bodies to ensure that victims and witnesses of crime are provided with information at the appropriate time about available services and can make an informed decision about whether or not to avail of those services. The committee agreed back at the meeting on the 10th of September that it was content with the proposed statute rule to prescribe victim support NI for the purpose of enabling relevant information on victims and witnesses of crime to be disclosed to them and to prescribe NSPCC for the purpose of enabling relevant information about witnesses of crime to be disclosed to them. Such rule number 2015-330 was laid by the Department on the 22nd of September and is subject to the negative resolution procedure. There have been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee and the examiner of such rules has indicated he has no issues raised with regard to the technical aspects of the rule. So again, if members are content, I'll put the question formally that the Committee for Justice considered such a rule 2015-330, the disclosure of victims and witnesses information prescribed body regulations no other than 2015, and has no objection to the rule. Are we content? Yep. Okay. Then item 8 then, can I refer members to pages 159 to 186? Uh, the committee has considered changes to firearms licensing fees on a number of occasions, most recently uh, on the 18th of June, when the department presented its latest proposals for existing fees, new fees and other firearms policy changes. The department is now proposing to make a statute rule to amend existing fees in line with the proposals outlined at the meeting on the 18th of June. Uh, they require primary legislation to be taken forward as amendments to the Justice No. 2 Bill, as members will be aware. Uh, the proposed statutory rule will be subject to the negative resolution procedure. So are we content with the proposed statutory rule? Okay, agenda item 9 then, can I refer you to pages 189, sorry, 187. Um, all public sector pension schemes, including the police pension scheme, is required to make a minor technical change to introduce a previously deferred consequential amendment for protection of increases in guaranteed minimum pensions after the abolition of the contracting out under Section 2 of the Public Services Pension Act. The Department is proposing to undertake a limited targeted consultation on the draft regulations with the Northern Ireland Policing Board, Police Associations and the PSNI to run from the 2nd of October through to the 6th of November. This will enable an Assembly debate to be scheduled on draft regulations in late January or early February 2016. <laughs> So are we content with the Department's proposal to undertake a limited targeted consultation and then once it uh, comes back we'll consider it further? Agenda item 10 can refer to page 201. Uh, just to remind the committee, in June 2015, the Department provided the committee with a copy of the draft UK Government's Action Plan responding to uh, European Court of Human Rights judgments on inquest, delay and occur group of cases. On the 22nd of September, the Department provided a copy of a draft revised action plan that the National Government is required to submit to the Council of Europe Committee of Ministers by the end of September. Uh, yesterday, the Department provided a revised draft of the action plan, and this has been circulated for members of pages 20 through to 28 of the tabled pack. The Department has outlined that there are three changes from the action plan in the meeting folder. The first is under the heading of legacy inquests and relates to the Lord Chief Justice assuming presidency of the coroner's courts. The first version indicated that the Lord Chief Justice will become president uh, of the coroner's court on 1st of November 2015 and the revised version indicates that discussions are taking place with the LCJ regarding the timing of assuming the presidency of the coroner's court. Uh, the Department has, however, stated that it remains the intention of the Minister that the, that the Chief Justice should become President on the 1st of November. Um, the other two changes have been brought forward by the NIO and include a reference to the £150 million pounds of additional funding which will be available for the Stormont House uh, Agreement measures. Um, so those are really for noting, unless any further information is required. Raymond? It's just in relation to uh, the initial was very specific that the Lord Chief Justice would assume the President of the Coroner's Court in the first and now discussions. If we could ask the Department you know, to keep us updated in the discussion with the view possibly of some time in the future briefing us, this doesn't happen because there's obviously issues around <coughs> 
this becomes a part of his brief, then the, the allocation of county court judges may, may create a gap elsewhere in the system, and I think that's maybe one of the issues under discussion. So just one may be an updated. Yep, so okay. possibly a briefing in the future. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, agenda item 11, then, is correspondence. There's eight items uh, from pages 215, <laughs> and then there's one item, page 30, of the table pack. So if we go through uh, just a couple of them to highlight. Item 1. Uh, is correspondence from the Department regarding the, re the retirement of Deputy State Pathologist for Northern Ireland. The Department has indicated that the Deputy State Pathologist is due to retire at the end of September and has been working on arrangements to fill his vacancy and the ongoing vacancy at State Pathologist level. In the interim period, transitional arrangements have been developed to maintain the service provided by the State Pathologist Department. Um, it, it might be useful if we if we requested further details on the transitional arrangements that we put in place, um, given that the recruitment exercise may take some time. So if members are happy enough, we'll, we'll do that. We need some assurances on that one, Mr Chairman. Yeah. Very, very important role of state by, by a state pathologist. Mm -hmm. If you're a state pathologist, I'm a deputy state pathologist. Okay. Like we're well, we're right to the department, and then if we get something back, members can um, decide whether or not we, we require a briefing or not. Or not. Um, agenda item, f or item four, sorry, is a response from the department to the committee's request for an update on the Northern Ireland Prison Service Pay Award. Uh, the Minister for Finance uh, approved the 15-16 Pay Award for prison grades on the 4th of September, and the Prisoners Officers Association, Prisoner Governors Association, and the Prison Service Pay Review Body have been informed of that decision. Subject to their approval, revised pay and arrears will be paid on the next available pay date, and the minister will formally notify the committee. So that's good news. Uh, item one at the table pack is a copy of two reports from the prisoner ombudsman uh, and the circumstances surrounding two deaths of men in custody at McGabry Prison. Uh, and uh, both of those uh, reports make a number of, of uh, recommendations for improvement. So again, those are just really to note, unless anyone wants any further information on them. I mean, the next time the prison service is on, then they could be raised at that stage and all their due. Sure. Okay. Any other items of correspondence? If not, Chairman's business. No real items other than to say. Sorry, Bromia. Yeah. Chair, under correspondence, right? We have got a, the uh, publication of the views on alcohol and drug-related issues, and you know, I haven't just read it fully in detail, but I've read it over it, and you know, there's there's big concerns, and I've recently I've saw stats regarding costs to the health system right across the north, and I'm just wondering, is there any? Action that we can take on that as a committee, or you know, are there any existing strategies, you know, to look at this problem? I'm certainly right to the department that I ask in terms of what yeah, strategy there are. If there's any joint initiatives with uh, the Department of Health, happy yeah. to do it. No, certainly health is having um, strategies in substance abuse and drugs. Yeah. And they have an ASD program. Which is quite extensive, and then trusts have various pieces of support, but I'm not sure what um, justice is doing on it. I know that the biggest cost is actually to justice, not to health. Yeah, I remember Raymond raised the point of put psychoactive, uh, psychoactive substances yeah. before. It might actually be something we could do a, a, get a briefing on yeah. the whole arena of, of substance abuse and, and the impact on justice. If members are agreed, we could. Yeah, sure. We're a bit tight for scheduling stuff in, but I'm sure we could, yeah. we could find a solution. Okay. okay, Chairman's Business then. Nothing other than there was a good event uh, upstairs over lunchtime. Unfortunately, the guest speaker was delayed because uh, her plane was cancelled this morning and she ended up trying to drive to our airport to get over. Um, they're going to send us through the um, the notes of the, I mean, I know Paul and, and Sean had said a wee bit later than I could, um, but they're going to send us a slide from that around the psychologists and their work in the criminal justice system. So it was, it was quite interesting. And um, the other thing I did yesterday was I did the shadowing with the uh, bar council with a couple of barristers after doing it with the judges, and again, they were keen if anybody else wanted to do something similar, that they could spend half a day down at the courts with the, the, the barristers and see them see them in action, so to speak, um, and that invitation is open to any uh, member who wished to, to take it up. Um, agenda 13, I will be, if there's no other business, then move on to the final agenda item, which is date, time and place of the next meeting, the 8th of October, 2pm in this room. Okay, thanks very much.